And I'm Josh Golke. I'm the deputy opinion editor for the Sacramento Bee. I'd like to welcome the candidates uh, running for state assembly in the seventh district. Um, appreciate them joining us. And I'll start by giving uh, each of the candidates three minutes to introduce themselves and tell us uh, why they're running. Um, and we can start with uh, Assemblyman Cooley. Well, thank you, Josh. Thank you for the opportunity just to talk about this race. Um, yeah, I currently serve in the Assembly. I was 10 years on the Rancho Cordova City Council. I was the founder, one of the founders there. And then at year 10, the last time remaps were done, there was no Assembly member in my area, and I opted to run. So I'm in my 10th year in the State Assembly. Um, this year, my wife and I will have our 47th anniversary. And that's relevant because we've lived in this district for 45 years. We moved here about a year and a half into our marriage. Our sons grew up here. Uh, both went into ministry, although my youngest son is just transitioning from Foothill Church across the county line in uh, Cameron Park. And my son is still senior pastor at our church. Um, I, I'm running because I sort of have a history in the institution and enjoy what I do. I'm not jaded. I feel it's an opportunity to make a difference every day. Um, I moved here because I was hired into the legislature as a young guy to the chair of the rules committee. And I'd never worked a day in the building. He'd gone through three people in four years. He and I were together for eight years. This means I've actually seen the unicorn as a lawmaker. I'm the only lawmaker in California who's not only seen, but worked on a successful veto override. I'm sort of the author of increased accountability. We have a guide to accountability through oversight on the assembly website. I got that published online five years ago uh, as rules chair. I'm a leader in oversight nationally at the Council of State Governments West, where I'm involved in oversight, and through the National Council of Insurance Legislators, where I'm also national president of 50 state organization of lawmakers that know a good deal about insurance. I'm I'm running basically, I feel I am the only member really in the institution except for my senator. Jim Nielsen, who actually go back to the old days, members of stature, they knew the office, they knew how to conduct their work in a collegial manner. I'm definitely very collegial. I treat all my members well. I uh, am working on getting funds for rural California and a rural infrastructure act uh, to serve primarily our smaller counties, the great state of Jefferson, as I remind my colleagues in the capital. Uh, and I will be the member with my history that trains the new members that come in. Um, as rules chair, I oversee training of all the members. So at this watershed election, me with my career focused on the institution, on oversight, on respect for colleagues, moving the ball forward, I will lead the training enterprise and look forward to that. So I'll wrap up now. I thank you for the opportunity to be here. It's an honor to serve, and I look forward to serving uh, two more years. Thanks, Assemblyman. Uh, Mr. Hoover. Thank you, and thank you for having me as well. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be a part of the discussion with Assemblyman Cooley. Um, I am a parent of three. Uh, I grew up in this community uh, in Folsom and uh, left for a little little while and my wife and I when we started to have our family we wanted to come back and and raise our kids here I think that's what a lot of folks choose this community for and love this community for um, so I've been raising uh, my family here for many years we have a 13 year old a 10 year old and an eight year old I'm also a Folsom Cordova school board member um, I was elected in 2018, um, and I've also worked in the state legislature for over a decade for numerous members of the legislature. Um, I think when I was elected to school board in 2018, uh, none of us really knew what was about to hit us uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic and all the challenges that that 
uh, raised, particularly for schools. I've talked to a lot of local elected officials and state elected officials, and I think they all agree that school board positions may have been one of the toughest jobs of the, the last few years. Um, I worked uh, very hard to uh, over the last few years to safely reopen our schools. We were the uh, Folsom Cordova was the first district in Sacramento County to, to bring kids back to in person instruction. Um, we also I, I, as I'm also the father of a child in, on the autism spectrum and uh, one of my priorities has been our special education students. And so um, we also worked very hard during the pandemic to make sure that um, when as soon as they were able, our special education students were able to come back um, for as many days as possible per week because they had the most challenges with uh, Zoom school. Um, and we also, uh, I also pushed for new transparency measures uh, and pushed for requirements that we live stream all of our meetings. And so we've brought that aspect forward in Folsom Cordova. And we just recently scored a major victory by uh, approving all day kindergarten starting next year in our district and, and also um, in increasing instructional minutes for our first and second graders. Um, uh, I've worked on a number of other things, but I'm not running for school, but I'm running for state assembly. And I'm running because I love this community and I, I really think we need a return to common sense policies in California. Um, I think our uh, residents in this community want great schools, they want safe neighborhoods, and they wanna be able to afford to live here. I've had very uh, many friends that have left the state, sadly, not just because of the politics, but because they just can't afford it and they want to be able to own a home and live out the American dream. And so uh, that's why I'm running here. I think Californians are looking for change. I think they're looking for a more balanced legislature and someone that's going to work across the aisle to get things done. All right. Thanks a lot. Um, I wanted to uh, start uh, speaking of that uh, issue, just by asking you both about the housing crisis, the legislature has obviously uh, struggled in recent years to make much of a dent in the in the pretty vast uh, housing shortage we have in in California, which has repercussions we're all familiar with in terms of prices and homelessness. Um, I'm wondering what uh, it w there was the recent law um, uh, legalizing duplexes and fourplexes in most of the state, uh, which is already facing a lot of resistance from local governments. I'm wondering what you each think the legislature can and should do to expedite the sort of really uh, massive uh, amounts of construction that would be needed to get us anywhere near a normal level of housing supply. Um, and we can start with you this time, uh, Josh. Absolutely. I, I think it's a great question. And, you know, part of uh, my opening kind of speaks directly to this where, um, you know, as a young, uh, you know, the father in a young family myself, I think we we need to get California back to a place where we can have you know, young families can afford to buy a home and raise their family. And, you know, I think some of these recent efforts in the legislature, um, I, I think they may be, uh, they're, they're nibbling around the edges, but what I really think we need to do, you know, when Governor Newsom was elected, he uh, committed to building 3.5 million homes in this state. And when he said that, I was fully on board with that. I think we absolutely need to do that. Um, but uh, we haven't seen that the follow through on that. And I think we're gonna need more than these kind of, I think, nibbling bills to get that done. I think we need broad CEQA reform that's not just for sports stadiums and things like that, but we need CEQA reform for actual housing projects. Uh, Governor Jerry Brown called that the Lord's work when he was in office. And I wanna see that for housing projects across the state. I think until we see a major reform on that issue and a major slash in fees and regulations on builders, I think we're gonna continue to have this housing crisis um, and, it's, and and that's combined, obviously, with the the cost of all these building materials going up too, right? And so, um, when when you add up all those costs, families just can't afford those homes. So, I would love to see a broad, broader efforts at reform on that. Thanks, Assemblyman. Well, on the 
you know, I, I'm in the position of being a legislator and a lawyer, but someone who we formed our city in 03, 04, I got active with the League of Cities. By 09, I was a statewide first vice president. And but for a career change, I would have been president of the league, the statewide leader. So when that auxiliary auxiliary dwelling unit bill came through, I was strongly in support of it. I actually felt it was important for me as a past leader of the League of California Cities to say, we can live with this. This is not a problem. Um, I think we need to look hard at how we support infill areas. Uh, you know, Josh and I both live in communities that are growing rapidly. I've walked all the new neighborhoods south of Highway 50 already since January. I love going door to door. But we're growing in those areas. But those are greenfield areas. Those are a lot easier to build than infill. I think we need to look at where do we put our priorities to support growth and enhancement where it's needed. I mentioned my uh, rural California infrastructure bill. With all this money we have, I've had the view for several years that we should set aside a billion dollars and let local governments in our smaller, less populous counties spend it on their local priorities, which could support infrastructure that would sustain housing. I think that's the idea. If you want to do something, you have to release energy. That bill is more than money. It's trying to release energy at the local level, focus on things. You know, I do know that in Rancho Cordova, we have Folsom Boulevard which has been developed since, you know, before 50. That type of area is very expensive to ask a developer come in and add something new, even though it's infill and it's more sustainable because there's less driving involved. I think we as a state ought to look at committing capital to infill areas where growth is possible so that some of the essential infrastructure which undergirds construction can be borne by that mechanism. In the old days, prior to Prop 13, which I've been a strong defender of, uh, even to the point of opposing Prop 19, which passed, but I wrote the ballot arguments with um, the uh, Property Tax Limitation Committee against it because I protect Prop 13. We haven't had a good way to pay for that infrastructure. That is what came readily out of the old system. Today, it has to come out of the developer. And I think... Um, if we put some of that money into the ground to, to help areas get ready for development, particularly in infill areas, that's solving a big problem that can lead to less costly infill housing. My name is Hannah Holzer. I'm opinion assistant. Um, I think it's important that we maybe address the elephant in this race, which is the fact that in addition to running against each other, you're also running against an out and proud Proud boy, um, I'm wondering what you think about that. Does he have a shot at winning? And are you willing and able to denounce the Proud Boy organization and, and white supremacy? Um, Assemblyman Cooley, I'll start with you. Well, I actually started with a mailer on that topic um, to the effect that that is not welcome in Sacramento County. I've already done mail on that single issue. I actually think it is, it is, it is worrisome uh, I, I think that we live in a great community, but there's, uh, there is wide divergent opinions. And when you have four Republicans in the race, as we have here, uh, and somebody who will probably assert that they're the real Trump candidate in the race, probably that's kind of the rhetoric. It's kind of a big wild card. Um, I, uh, so I've actually already got blowback because I did do a mailer on this issue and, um, I tried not to take the stance that I hate the proud boys cause that's same, same, but I do think, you know, I'm a, I'm a former scout master. I do Eagle Scout courts of honor all over the region. I've done 200 Eagle Scout courts of honor. There is a baseline of just solid community people that uh, I think need to be reminded, as Abraham Lincoln said, of our better angels. You know, where do we want to be? What's a sustainable path for our whole community? It's why I treat my colleagues with respect. I feel I, I don't serve with 60 elected officials. I serve with 120. We are all constitutionally empowered, need to work together. 
I feel is very vital that we model that. And I think any race I'm in is going to model that idea of we govern with respect for all, collegiality towards all. Uh, that's that's how you build a future together. And anyone who takes a different stance, I think, is stepping on the air hose of the future to mix metaphors for my journalist friends. Thank you, Mr. Hoover. Absolutely happy to denounce the Proud Boys. Um, I think that the, and I won't even honestly mention the candidate's name. I, I think the fact that um, this uh, person is in the race is unfortunate. Um, and we're not going to take anything for granted. You know, we, we, um, we're going to, we're going to beat him uh, on our side uh, as one of the four Republicans in the race. We plan to be the top Republican at the end of the primary. And, um, you know, just a reminder that this uh, is the same gentleman that was kicked out of the Republican Party in Sacramento County because of his radical associations. Um, we, we, we can't have someone like that representing us. And um, I'm happy to uh, be running to, uh, to, to win, win this uh, uh, side of things for the Republicans in the primary to make sure that doesn't happen. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Hoover, I just wanted to follow up on that. Um, your boss, Representative Kevin Kiley, has posted a photo with neo-Nazi Chelsea Knight, who's an administrator of a neo-Nazi telegram channel. And he also agreed to serve as a featured speaker at a March 2021 rally co-organized by Cordy Williams, who two months before publicly called on Americans to arm for civil war. So I'm just wondering if you could explain the fact that you're willing to denounce Proud Boys yet your your boss has has posed with neo-nazis um so i don't know the background on any of that but i can tell you right now that elected officials take photos with a lot of people and i think democrats and republicans on both sides uh throughout this state can admit that uh they don't always know who they're taking photos with so um, i can't really comment beyond that because i don't know any of the other information i'll jump in with a question here my name is Robin Epley. I'm an opinion columnist. Uh, it's nice to have you both here today. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you, in lieu of what happened in downtown Sacramento the other week, uh, the mass shooting, that uh, California has had more and tougher gun laws than most other states, but legislators are still looking for ways to stem the sort of violence that has racked Sacramento this year. Uh, should the legislature pass an excise tax on guns to fund violence prevention programs? a version of which died last year for lack of support. And what else can state lawmakers do about this? Um, Ken, let's start with you. Yeah. Well, I will not support the excise tax. I'm part of the reason it didn't move forward. Mr. Levine's bill, I told him I would not be uh, supportive of that. Um, we do have extremely strong gun laws in this state, uh, but we're sort of having a breakdown in relationships. It's it's a broader issue than the gun itself. I think uh, it's very important to me. You know, my wife was a bookkeeper for a church for 42 years until she retired. Both my sons started their professional life in ministry. I think that that's not to say that our particular denomination is the way of the entire world, but I think we need to find ways to support active and engaged civic life but I do think that there's some political format to me to push the well-to-do California setting aside $1 billion for our smaller, less populous counties is actually modeling the way a democracy ought to work. I think that that's, um, I don't favor, I'm often a no vote on some of the strong gun laws. I don't think it's quite that pat a problem. Um, I won't support that tax. I do think we need to we need to focus on just how we function as a society. And that's why I actually feel part of what makes me different in the assembly is I'll stand up and trash on the floor of the assembly a bad bill, as I did with Lorena Gonzalez's AB 257 dealer franchising uh, in June of last year. Um, and, uh, you know, we're in the process of rebuilding the Capitol. And under my leadership, my Republican colleagues have the best offices of their careers because I didn't put them in the little tiny uh, spaces. So I think you need to walk the talk of collegiality and that's, we need to model that as leaders, but hold it out, hold it forth as something that all should engage in. Thank you, Mr. Hoover. Uh, 
the better angels problem. Um, can you just repeat the question? So I, I, it's been a couple minutes, so. Yeah. Sorry, I think you're muted, I'm sorry. No worries, sorry, I clicked away from the, the page. Um, hang on, here we go. <clears throat> uh, just that California has more and tougher gun laws, um, but that legislators are still looking for ways to stem the violence. So uh, should the legislature pass an excise tax on guns to fund violence prevention programs, um, version of which died last year for lack of support, uh, or what else can state lawmakers do about this? Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so first off, I would just say that I don't support that effort. I don't support that bill. Um, I don't support a tax um, on guns. Um, and, and honestly, you know, I think you made the point in the question, uh, California has some of the strictest gun laws in the nation, and these tragedies are still happening in our communities. Um, I, I certainly support uh, any efforts that are being done to take guns out of the hands of criminals. I think we have to do that. That is something that I believe our AG currently um, had recently put something out about uh, trying to improve, but we have to improve that. And as the legislature, we have to support those efforts. But when it comes to uh, gun laws, uh, they tend to affect law-abiding gun owners, but do very little to stop criminals from getting their hands on weapons. Um, I, I think that if the legislature is serious about stemming the tide of violence in our communities, then they need to look at other policies that are failing Californians. And, um, you know, just just as an example, we have had two tragedies in this in this com in, in our community here in the Sacramento region in recent weeks. Um, you know, one of which um, involved someone who uh, was uh, let out of uh, jail based on uh, regulations that allowed for more early release credits to be given. Uh, that's something that's being discussed today at CDCR, um, and I think that's something that we cannot continue in this state. Um, we rehabilitation is critical. We have to rehabilitate our inmates, but we cannot let people out early uh, who have not been rehabilitated. It's that simple. Uh, and then the second thing is our sanctuary state policy in this in this state. Um, you know, we we passed a law a few years back that um, bans our law enforcement officers from com communicating with federal authorities um, when a a criminal is released. Uh, who is in this country illegally. And I think we need to seriously take a look at that policy. And uh, the one of these tragedies that happened recently, uh, the gunman had been arrested just a few days before for assaulting a police officer and was sent back out on the streets and ICE was not notified. And so I, I think we have to look at the root causes of some of these issues and ask ourselves, has the pendulum t swung too far? And we need to readjust some of our criminal policies uh, to, to make sure that people are not being let out when they shouldn't be. Um, I'm going to switch topics here to talk about homelessness. Um, so Sacramento area lawmakers are backing a bill to clear encampments of homeless people from the American River Parkway. Um, given the lack of shelter and housing for any of them to really to relocate to, do you believe that this bill is reasonable? Um, and Mr. Hoover, let's start with you. Well, I believe uh, Mr. Cooley is, uh, or Assembly Member Cooley, I should say, is one of the authors of that bill. So I would Believe assume, <laughs> I would, yeah, exactly. I would assume he supports the legislation. Um, look, I support this effort. Um, absolutely. I think, um, I, I honestly think we could even go farther um, and expand it to um, areas, other public spaces, such as our public parks. I think our community wants compassionate treatment. I think our community wants to make sure that people have housing. But at the end of the day, they also want to be able to use their public facilities, their public trails, their public parks um, as the taxpayers that paid for those facilities. And we have to find a way to do both of those things. Um, and, and I think so much of it, and you, you know, Hannah, you mentioned housing. Um, it is a housing issue, but it's not just a housing issue. You know, there are so many folks uh, in our homeless community who uh, you could give them housing, but that does not, again, solve the root cause of 
their problem. And in so many cases, you know, we need to expand mental health treatments. We need to uh, make sure that it's possible for people to get the treatment that they need. And we need to uh, also get people substance abuse treatment uh, for drug related issues. And I think one of the most uh, unfortunate things in the last few years that I think is underreported is when the voters passed Proposition 47, which you know, a lot of Proposition 47, the focus is on the smash and grab crime, which I think is a, a terrible thing. Um, but the other thing that Prop 47 did is it completely gutted our drug courts. It took away incentives uh, for, uh, for DAs to basically offer substance abuse treatment as an alternative to jail time. And as a result, we have fewer people seeking drug treatment. And I, th I think that is contributing to uh, our increase in homelessness. The reality too is that our state has spent $12 billion or more on homelessness in the past few years. And the problem has only grown. We have more homeless on our streets today than we had um, three years ago. And I think that's something that we seriously need to look at. We need to audit our homeless spending, uh, homelessness spending in California. And we need to find out the programs that are working, focus our money on those programs, we also need to identify the programs that aren't working and make sure that we're not funding programs that aren't working. So um, that's what I would say on homelessness. Thank you, Assemblyman. Yeah. Well, with respect, with respect to the bill, can, I, I am the lead author, actually. It's my bill. Mr. McCarty, Mr. Cooper are joining me on it. I, I actually believe that the, the case in question, Martin versus Boise, is being applied too broadly. It was settled at the, by the Ninth Circuit. It, it was passed over by the U.S. Supreme Court of Review. Therefore, it is good law. But I'm a lawyer, and I think the way it is being applied, it is it is being too broadly applied. Our parkway, I agree with Josh. Taxpayers set this aside, but even more visionaries set it aside. People who care for our outside habitat. This is such a long thread in American history. You know, in wildness is the preservation of mankind. Uh, long ago said by Emerson. Uh, it's a, you know, the parkway has for decades, it's open at sunrise, it closes at sunset. That's not just a people rule. It's because this is wildlife habitat. People want to be able to get out there and discover what lives there. They don't need people junking it up at all hours. That goes against making it a welcoming place for habitat. So animals that are native to the region can settle there, can be safe there at night. And kids, you know, Rancho Cordova, my kids, heck, I, I used to work at the Mills Middle School. We'd take them camping to Monterey Bay every couple of years. The teachers run a math science camp. I'd actually run the campsite. I did this even before and after I became an assembly member. Um, but uh, this is, my kids don't experience the out of doors except in the parkway. Those kids out the ocean have never seen it before. So coming back to it, you know, one of the great things about Rancho Cordova, after they closed the Air Force Base with 5% of the county's population, we maintained housing for 30 to 38% of the county's emergency and transitional housing out there at Mather, right in Rancho Cordova. But it's housing supported by services and Never did that produce a peep of unrest in the community because it had that model. It got people in stable in housing, but got them into services. It's the same model used by the heart programs, housing assistance relief teams. You know, people have to come in. They got, get vetted on the way in that night to make sure they're not drunk or on drugs. They pass that test and they get to another place where there's clean conditions for living housing. They're they get fed, they have a breakfast in the morning. I support those sorts of things that help people uh, that are prepared to be helped. Um, I, I don't know how we solve this issue, but uh, I definitely believe parks, special places that are set aside for special purposes like the parkway, uh, to say that somebody with a tent can upend the what the parkway represents for our region is astonishing to me. That's why I think eventually uh, the Martin case will Next be- Next assemblyman, I'm sorry I have to interrupt you there. Okay, uh, 
Um, I, I do want to follow up on this question, though. Um, you know, I know there's kind of a, uh, an idiosyncratic debate within California about whether homelessness actually has anything to do with housing, but there's actually a mountain of research showing that uh, home homelessness is pretty closely tied um, as a matter of statistics and reality to uh, the lack of housing and the price of housing. And California has fewer homes per capita than just about any other state. Um, I think there might be one or two states that compete with us on that uh, statistic. One of them is an archipelago and the other is Utah, uh, and neither is remotely comparable to California. We have about um, an eighth of the country's population, a quarter of its homeless people, and half of its unsheltered people. So there's just nowhere for people to go. Uh, you know, there's, there's no shelter for the people who are going to be cleared from the parkway or anywhere else for the most part, um, maybe some small percentage of them will, will have a place to go, but most of them will end up camping somewhere else. I mean, should we be troubled that we're gonna clear them anyway, even though there isn't anywhere for them to go? And isn't it uh, your obligation as a legislator or someone running to be a legislator to have an answer for that question? and? Um, explain to us why we should be rousting people out of where they live, even though we don't have anywhere else for them to live? Uh, Assemblyman, go ahead. Sure. Well, the companion to the bill is a budget appropriation proposal of $50 million to support the county in its programs. So it is a bill coupled with a budget move. Mr. McCarty, who does the budget work, is on point on that. But it's the same thing. Jim Cooper, me, Mr. McCarty, working on getting that funding. Um, I guess to me, Josh, uh, I don't think it is inherently inconsistent as a public official to say that we're going to provide housing for people for some place, but someone cannot just upend other important public values because they want to pitch a tent and be there. You know, the gentleman that that uh, brutally murdered Emma Rourke was just, you know, camped out within a mile of my home. Um, it's these sorts of things affect people's willingness to even enter the parkway and long term that spells trouble. So, um, you know, FDR said a long time ago, you, you, you sometimes have to be able to operate with two inconsistent ideas in your head at the same moment and not and retain the ability to function. I do think that communities need more than the homes they're situated in. They need nearby areas. I think parks, parkways, those are actually very important. My bill focuses strictly on parkway types of places. Um, but uh, and then we work on the funding thing. Most years I served on the select committee of homelessness going back to 2013. I was active on the homeless working group when I was an officer of the League of Cities, I have a, a huge interest in it. As I said, I've always defended what we do in Rancho Cordova. I didn't feel imposed upon that we had 38% of the formerly homeless in Rancho with 5% of that county population. I felt it was working. You can't worry about that. Um, I, uh, you know, long when I was on the city council and 2006, you could even ask Dave Jones about this hearing. We had an affordable housing ordinance in Rancho Cordova adopted in 2006. I actually had to argue through it all night long when I was, my posted place of business was a hotel in Florida because I was on the East Coast. They took the issue up at 11 p.m. East Coast time and it went on till five. Um, but we had an ordinance. When I left the city council, Rancho Cordova did change the policy to get rid of that affordable housing ordinance in the new growth areas. That's unfortunate, um, but I still think this idea, we do need to help the developers with, if we want housing with some of the uh, infrastructure that supports the housing. It, it's all a very complicated financial mix, uh, but I've actually fought for 
affordable housing ordinances. I support the ADUs. I had a rapid rehousing bill uh, modeled on the Utah one, actually. Um, and um, but it's complex for everyone, including homeowners who live near parks in the parkway. Thanks. Josh, are, are you or should we be at all troubled uh, by the idea that we're going to continue evicting people from the places where they live because they don't have housing or shelter, even though we don't have any housing or shelter for them to go to and they're probably just going to end up camping somewhere else? Thanks for the question, Josh. You know, first of all, you're not going to get any argument from me on, you know, the lack of affordable housing in California. I think I've, you know, already stated as a young family, um, you know, it's it's very difficult, you know, to not just purchase a home, but even afford rent right now. And, you know, there has to be solutions for that. But I think we get into this challenge with homelessness where we talk about it as a kind of a singular issue with a singular type or definition of what homeless means. And I think, you know, the reality is, is that uh, those who are homeless are, are homeless for different reasons. You know, there are a lot of folks in our community that uh, it, it was an affordability issue or they lost the job or they, you know, they, they had a bad break in life. And there are services to help those folks. And I, I and we can have a conversation certainly about expanding those services, but there are certainly shelters and job programs and things in our communities that are being run by our counties and our cities um, to help folks get back on their feet. And we can have that conversation about how to better do that. Um, but there are also folks that are homeless that uh, they're, they're homeless either because of substance abuse issues or mental health issues. And we can also have a conversation, and I think the governor has started doing this, about what can we do to, for example, get people into mental health treatment. Um, but the reality is, is we can't talk about it as one specific problem, because I think it's many different problems. But at the end of the day, so I actually live next to a park. My house is literally next to a park. And occasionally we will have homeless sleep in that park. And our neighbors and myself have found needles in our park where my children play. At the end of the day, this is a public safety issue as well. And we cannot uh, we cannot say that just because, um, you know, these folks don't have another place to go that we need to let them take over our public spaces. I don't think that that's uh, a fair solution. I don't think that's fair to the taxpayers. And I don't think that's safe for the families whose kids want to use these facilities and these trails. Um, so I, I think we need to come to uh, a place where we can talk about this issue holistically. But no, I am I, I do not feel that um, those who are homeless have a right to these areas just because it is the place where they have decided to put their tent. Other questions? Yeah, I'm going to jump in here, uh, change the subject again for a minute. Um, the Public Utilities Commission is considering a reform of rooftop solar programs that give generous subsidies to certain households and make it easier for widespread adoption. Utility companies say the cost for these programs get passed on to the lower income residents. Two part question here for you guys. First one is where do you stand on this issue and what role does rooftop solar play in California's clean energy transition? And uh, let's go with Josh first. Thank you. Uh, so I I feel pretty strongly that we need to keep the promise that we've had for these solar uh, owners for a long time, the, the system that we set up. I think we need to keep it that way and make sure that we're not taking away the benefits that we as a state offered to them. Uh, I am excited about the, the role that solar will play in our future uh, energy uh, production. I think it's already playing a critical role. But I also think that uh, we need to do a lot more uh, in, in energy to prepare for the future uh, if that is going to include electric, more electric vehicles and more uh, electric infrastructure. Um, I, I also would just add that I, I don't support the solar house mandate. Um, I, I, did, I do not support requiring um, that builders install solar onto homes. And, and the main reason for that is that affordability issue. It, it adds twenty dollars to $30,000 to the cost of a new home at a time when Californians can't afford homes already. And so uh, I would say while I support solar 
energy. I, and, and I support incentives for solar energy. I don't support the mandate that increases the cost of housing in California. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'll just, I'll, I'll stop with that. Thank you. Uh, Samina Kui? Yeah, I don't actually favor redoing the deal. Rancho Granova, we have solar neighborhoods. I know the Folsom Ranch neighborhood has lots of, plenty of solar in those homes. You can see the technology on the house. Uh, on the panels that accompany it. Um, I don't, yeah, I, I think the policy was set up to encourage solar. I think it is encouraging solar. I think people bought into those homes with the expectation of how the solar would be a part of their living experience and, and what they paid for power, so their cost of living. So I don't favor this, you know, late revision rethinking the deal that was already done and established policy so i don't i do not favor the proposed changes at the puc at all um and um so i uh i think the question of how it works out how it how it pencils pencils out for home ownership is vitally important to folks it is a part of the home ownership question but um that's that's a bigger issue here but in general i think you know solar is a good thing and i look at through the lens you know solar has changed so much in the last 20 years and i expect it will continue to change the equipment that's able to make use of the power the, the rise of battery technology there are so many things going on and i think it needs to be encouraged to continue um, and I do think it is something that's in the mix that can uh, make the total homeowner experience pencil out. We shouldn't get in the way of that. Um, I wanted to stay on this thread to talk um, a bit more, but more specifically about climate change. Um, California was once considered a leader on climate and environmental policy, but in recent years, a Democratic supermajority in the legislation has routinely stalled or killed sensible policies that could aid the clean energy transition and reduce greenhouse gases. Um, the building trades and labor groups have put their thumbs on the scale time and time again to kill climate proposals supported by most Californians. So my question is, if elected, are you willing to stand up to the trades if and when they organize against future climate bills? And Assemblyman Cooley, let's start with you. Yeah, I think um, I'm a reader. I read the bills and try to evaluate what I think should be done. I'm actually probably the only legislator in either house that has stood up and opposed in speaking against labor supported bills the franchise council bill that i mentioned from june of last year ab 257 being the principal example uh i said it was eroding the rule of law star chamber being set up i said a whole lot of things uh in in fighting that bill in the same way prop 19 which i didn't like because it changed prop 13 and the ability of parents to pass on their assets to their kids in a way that I didn't think the average voter would realize what they're being asked to do. Uh, that was strongly supported by certain labor groups. And I, I say, I not only voted no, I wrote the ballot argument. So my opposition was in black and white and it was mailbox. Um, so I do view myself as someone who will try to be careful and think hard on what I believe are the economic consequences of the bills and vote accordingly. So. Again, I'm. I do know that I'm seen as uh, a person who will be fearless to speak up and say my view, even when I differ with my majority party. Um, and uh, sometimes I've been. I've got. I've got a letter from President Obama because of my leadership votes back uh, in 2016, uh, personally signed. You can sort of tell that type of thing. Uh, but there's other bills where I've not been persuaded. And um, I think they're committing us to a course that when the course is not yet clear and settled. Um, I, I, I don't like putting all my eggs in one basket when I have a suspicion. There's actually a couple other baskets out there that are not being looked at. 
that actually strikes me as more irresponsible than uh, or more enthusiastic than responsible. Mr. Hoover. Thank you. Um, so, you know, I'll just I'll try to say this as uh, I guess concisely as I can. Um, I, I think that first of all, I'm very I'm looking very looking forward to a clean energy future, and I think our nation is going to get there one way or another. Um, and not because of government. I think it's going to happen because of in, uh, uh, movements forward in technology, because of investment by private industry. And while I do think the government can play a role in incentivizing that future, I do not support bills that mandate that future. I think uh, when we try to mandate something, particularly before the technology is there to actually achieve those goals, and in California, for example, um, you know, uh, for example, our electric car goals. By the way, I drive an electric vehicle and I love it. And why do I drive it? Because it saves money on gas and gas prices are through the roof. Um, but here's the reality is that our grid is not ready for the clean energy future. We do need to be preparing for that. And we do need to be making investments in that. But I think that we need to be very careful about mandating that future because that is what's driving the cost of living in California. So much of the increase in costs in California are because of government mandates, doing things too soon before they're ready. And it's, it's making it harder for everyday Californians, including working families, to afford the price of gas, the price of groceries, and afford homes. And I think um, we need to, we will get there, but I think that govern, government needs to be very careful about what it does um, and it's and the role that it plays in that. Josh, can I just ask a quick follow up? Um, you don't feel as though that there is a sort of a deadline on climate change in the future that we're up against a, a ticking clock, as it were, that would require something like the government to get involved to make mandates to to meet those goals. So uh, in terms of a ticking clock, I, I don't know what clock that would be. I, I know that there are, have been many, many different projections on the impact, you know, the impacts of climate change and on what that timeline looks like. But at the end of the day, uh, our private industry wants to go there. Uh, this is an area, it doesn't, it saves uh, tons and tons of money across the board to get us to a clean energy future once we're there. And I think uh, that you know, creating policies that try to force things too quickly is just going to make it harder for Californians to afford things. But, but no, I, I mean, if you if you have a specific timeline that you've read, I'm happy to hear that out. But um, the reality is, is that climate change is there, and we do have to do things to address it. And I think our private industry is is working very hard to get us to that point. Got it. So uh, just to clarify, your your take on it is that uh, the business should set the speed of, of the future um, innovations in the field and not necessarily government mandates. I think those innovations are happening and I think government can play a role in incentivizing them, kind of like we've done with solar, um, but I don't support uh, mandates. Okay, thank you. Um, Assemblyman, uh, do you want to respond uh, to that? I can give you a couple of minutes if you do want to talk about whether we're uh, moving too quickly on this whole climate change thing and, and uh, solving it too fast. Uh, please go ahead. Yeah, let me just jump in. I'm trying to, um, this is an issue in 2008, when I was an officer of the league, I described that earlier. I kind of went through the league like that. I chaired the housing committee uh, when Daryl Steinberg's sustainable communities bill was being considered by the League of Cities. And so it was sort of my job to kind of manage that bill in that committee. I do think there's urgency. Robin, I don't know when the, where the clock is, actually. But I uh, think... Mostly referring to some of the science that has come out in the last. Decade. Yeah, no, I wasn't actually. You didn't need to respond. I, it's like okay. I don't need to know where the clock is. Okay. I actually think it, it's like the old time mariners. They didn't want to sit in the harbor when they had a good tide to exit and the wind was blowing the right way. You never know what's going to be there the next day. You need to move on things now. The most precious thing in life is time. Is not people. It's not money. It's not institutions, it's time. 
everything we do takes time. It takes concerted effort, marshalling resources. Everything takes time. So you need to be jumping out. In 2008, when I was managing the league's review of the Steinberg Sustainable Communities Bill, I pulled out an old FDR quote. I'm a fan of FDR. He appointed my grandfather postmaster of Healdsburg, California in the 40s. He said, one thing is sure, we have to do something. We have to do the best we know how at any moment. If it doesn't work, turn out right. We can modify it as we go along. So there's a guy in the depths of the depression saying, you don't have time to waste. You got to get on it. You do the best you can. Best you can in the moment, as well as you can see it. None of us has encyclopedic knowledge. We do the best we can and modify it as we go along. I mean, that's why... It's kind of what I'm saying about the the uh, Boise case, the Martin v. v. Boise. Fine, that's the ruling, but I believe that's going to get modified. I think it's overbroad. It's being applied in an improper way. I think we need to be pushed on that. So, yeah, I actually think all of these things we need to be doing the best we can in the moment, and I'm supportive of that, but I'm not supportive of doing, uh, you know, because of enthusiasm, take an over broad stance on something kind of act like all the uncertainty is gone and we can go down that trail when actually you don't, there are alternatives. John Kennedy, another good president said the governors to choose the corollary is you got to know the available choices. That's kind of where I sit as a member, figuring out the choices. So you're, you're agreeing with Josh then in that case, I just wanted to. Yeah. Though I, I do think there's a place at times for mandates to push things along. Okay. Because they sustain investment, they become a part of the economic calculus. But I'm not a, a just a knee jerk fan of mandates by any means. And you don't believe that we've reached the place where mandates are necessary yet, is what I'm hearing. Well, and I would say it's that all depends upon the specific mandate. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, Josh, can I add one thing or? Yeah, please feel free. I'll, I'll make it quick. Look, I, I also wanted to add, since I think it, it relates to this discussion, that I think if the legislature is truly, uh, you know, serious about climate change, we will reverse course on nuclear energy, nuclear energy and start to make huge investments in nuclear. Um, I, I think that that is, can and should be a part of the clean energy future. And it's something that we've seen co other countries do successfully. So I would support those efforts. Which countries specifically were you thinking of? Uh, I think you know, France uses nuclear to power a lot of its grid, and I think it's a very efficient and sustainable resource that needs to be a part of our portfolio for renewable energy. Yeah. Thank you. Gentlemen, I, just, I sorry, go ahead. Right. I just wanted to follow up quickly. Josh, you said um, that you were against government mandates. Is there any mandate you you think would be appropriate for the government to oppose any type of mandate you could see yourself supporting or is just broad no are you, are you, sorry Hannah, are you saying across the board or on energy specifically i'm saying across the board oh <laughs> well uh i mean it's a very broad question i really uh you know I, I i hate to speak in hypotheticals um but obviously we have laws on the books that we require people to follow, you know, particularly when it comes to things like public safety, you cannot do certain things. We mandate that certain actions are not allowed. Obviously, I'm supportive of those mandates. So, but um, yeah, I'd, I'd hate to speak in hypotheticals beyond that.